Continuing with ownership, there's still some very useful information we need to cover to get a better understanding on how the Rust language works. And to get started, I'm going to create a little snippet of code. And here we're going to write let mutable variable equal string from Bob. And immediately under it, we're going to type in variable equals string from bin. And next we're going to print hello variable. Now, when we open up the terminal and type in cargo run in quiet mode, what we're going to end up with is hello Ben. We're also going to get that warning that we never really used the original variable. As you can see, value assigned to var is never read. And that's a good warning to have because in theory, this is quite useless on its own, but I'm kind of digressing. What I wanted to talk about here is that we initially declared this variable to contain the value of Bob, but immediately under that, we changed that to Ben. And since nothing is referring to the original string of Bob, it immediately goes out of scope, causing Rust to run drop and release it from memory immediately. And that's good to know since it would be a huge pain to have to manually keep track of each variable we created, even when it's no longer being used. Now, in the previous lesson, I showed you that assigning an existing string to a new variable would not result in a copy. For example, we might have a var, which is equal to string, from Bob, and then we might have a copy. So we can type in var2 equals the original variable. Now, if we were to try to refer to the original one, we would end up with an error. And that's because it moved the data to var2. So this variable here is no longer valid and is released from memory. If we want to see that information, we need to refer to variable two, which now contains the information of variable one. So if we were to run that, what we should end up with is that variable two contains Bob. But now let's take a look at how we'd make a copy if that's what we intended to do. So what I'm going to do is remove this and rename this to something more meaningful, such as name. Now we can let the name copy equal our original name dot clone. And hovering over this method, you'll notice that this is going to return a copy of the value, which also means that we can use both of these values independently. So here we're going to debug the name and the name copy. And in the terminal, we can now run this and you'll notice that we will get the value back for both of them and that we were able to use both of them. And that's because this time we managed to copy that heap data. Although you have to be careful with this because it can be an expensive operation depending on the size of the data that you are copying. And you might be asking, what about that code we wrote earlier that copied integers? Here we had n1 equal to 100 and n2, which was equal to n1. Why did this work fine? And here we can use both of them using the debug macro. And I didn't show you this earlier, but you can pass in multiple arguments here. So you can put n1 and n2, and it's going to debug both of those separately, which is really cool. As you can see, it saved us one line of code, but we still got the same result. But why does this work? Why isn't n1 released from memory as soon as we move the data onto n2? The reason is that types that have a known size at compile time such as integers are stored entirely on the stack. So copies of the actual values are quick to make and don't require any further processing like when we use clone with the string type. Also, taken directly from the docs, Rust has a special annotation called the copy trait. And we can place this on types that are stored on the stack as integers are. What's important to know is that if a type implements the copy trait, variables that are using it do not move, but are trivially copied, which makes them still valid after assignment to another variable. Just like in this example, n1 was not moved to n2, it was trivially copied. And we'll learn more about the copy trait in a future lesson. But for now, we will cover what types can actually implement the copy trait. As a general rule, any of the simple scalar values can implement copy and nothing that requires allocation or is of some form of resource can implement copy. For example, all the integer types such as i32, u32, i16, all of these integer types are good examples of scalar values that implement the copy trait. Otherwise, also the Boolean type and floating point types and the character type and even tuples if those tuples only contain types that also implement copy. For example, i32 and i32, while i32 and string would not work because string does not implement that copy trait. And once again, if something implements the copy trait, it is easy to copy. For example, let number and 
number copy equal number. This was quite easy to do because the integer implements the copy trait. And that means that we can use both of these variables without having to worry about moves. So if we're to clear the console, run the code, you'll see that we'll get both of our variables displaying their data in the console. But if we were to create a string from Bob's mom and we were to copy that by typing in let text copy equal text, since text does not implement the copy trait, this is going to move the data onto the text copy, which means we can debug only the text copy and that will work fine. But as soon as we try to debug or use text, that's not going to work anymore because it does not exist anymore. It was released from memory. But that's really all I wanted to cover in today's video. In the next video, we will continue with the final video on ownership.